begun a correspondence with him and is willing to leave her common law husband if only Lyle will agree to marry her. Please welcome Celia Velez and Christine Lee. Hi, welcome both of you. You say you go to San Quentin every two weeks mm -hmm. to, right. to see Richard Ramirez. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you saw him? I saw him on Sunday. And um, where he's at now, um, he's not allowed visitors like the way he used to be allowed because there's too many problems. When you go there, what, what do you talk about? Mm, just everything. He doesn't act like <laughs> somebody who's in so much trouble. Well, I, I'd say that's an understatement to say so much trouble. You know, I, I, I look at you and I think, I remember I had just moved to Los Angeles in, mm -hmm. the, in the mid 80s when the, the Night Stalker terror was going on and I, I boarded up my windows and, and... Well, I lived in New Jersey when it all happened, so there, there was absolutely nothing on the news about him at all. And even now, hardly anybody there knows who he is or what happens. And the only time I heard about it was when he told me, and all he said was he didn't do anything. And now only I've heard, you know, from the media and other people what happened. And now, he, he just, told you he did not commit the murders? Right. He swears up and down he didn't do anything. That's what he tells me. Well, he is obviously, as you know, a, a convicted killer. Right, but he has an appeal coming up and he has another trial coming up. And one of the jurors who convicted him is now, she goes to visit him also twice a week and she even sleeps in her car all night long so she makes sure she gets a visit with him and she says she doesn't think he did it and she feels that she was pushed into it into convicting him. Now, he tells you he's innocent. Mm hmm And you believe him. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's your, what's your attraction to this man who has this notoriety, who society and the jury, the, the judicial system says, you, you are guilty, we've, we've put him away. But you saw him and you felt sorry for him. Right. What was it? Was it a look in his eyes? Was mm, yeah. But um, I don't know. I just felt sorry for him being there. You know, there have been a lot of women that say they're in love with Richard Ramirez. You're intended. Well, there's been a few, and then they make it sound like that. But they're all like, the ones that have come up there to see him have been, like I said, the juror. And she's like 20 years older than him. And like I said, she sleeps in her car all night to make sure she gets a visit. And she's the only one that does that. And I don't know what she's trying to do. Well, he's become so much of a celebrity. But, but you, so I want to get back to what it is you saw about him. So you were attracted to him immediately. Celia's story is very much the same. Mm -hmm. You saw Lyle Menendez on court television, right? Yes. What, were your re what was your response? He was beautiful. He was a beautiful man. And I wondered what, what would a man like him go out and kill his parents for. So it was more that I was curious to find out. I wanted to write to him. I wanted to get to know him because it didn't look like he's very timid looking. I didn't understand why he would do that, so I wrote to him. To and and what did you write to him and say? I wrote and I, I asked him why he would commit such a crime. Did it not scare you that he was capable of doing this? Did you, did you think that he, was, that he was sick, that he was ill? I mean... No, that's the reason I wrote to him, because he didn't look. He looked innocent. And no one could tell me that. Even though he admitted having done it. Oh, yes, I know he did it, but I'm sure he had reason to. And he has written back to me, and he has. Well, okay, audience, hang on. Let's hear her out, because you'll get your say uh, in, in the next segment. But you have said, I want to be with this guy. You've never met him. Now, this is different no. than Christine's story. You've never met Lyle right, Menendez. she's not home. You are in, in a long-term relationship. Right. There's a man who is really your common-law husband. Yeah. Does he know that you, that you have what is more than a crush on Lyle Menendez? Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. And how does he feel? He has, he, what can he say? What can he do? It's something that happens. It's that I didn't ask to be in this situation. This is how it turns out. You know, I, I have a letter, if I may, Christine, from Richard Ramirez to you. There's been a lot of correspondence, of course. There have been some incredible artwork mm -hmm. uh, that he is, has given to you and some cards, some love letters. Mm -hmm. um, and you see one of them there. I mean, look at, look at this. Now, see that kind of an image. What what does that say to you? That somebody who's in prison and has a lot of time to do a lot of drawings. <laughs> I just want to read uh, something that he wrote to her. He calls her Chris. Dear Chris, I've fallen madly in love with you. Send me pictures of you. And Kenny and Steve, these are your children. Um, yeah. So he, he goes on to talk about various other things, and he says, stay strong 
and be happy. Stay strong, meaning until you can be together. Um, I guess so, yeah, because like I said, where he's at now, he's not allowed, he was allowed to use the phone and do a lot more things, and now he's not allowed to. But you want to, why, why, why do you want to marry him? Why not just have this relationship? Mm, I don't know. It was his idea to get married. Well, I mean, right now, obviously without conjugal visits, you cannot have physical contact with him, sexual contact. No, it, it's just, um, I didn't like him because he was in prison or something. I just, I don't know, I just felt sorry for him. I don't know why. So the idea of, 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 of having sex with a man who, it was said during the trial, basically would, would go into a home, kill the husband and rape well, and sodomize they, the wife. Like I said, the juror keeps coming up there all the time saying she thinks he didn't do it. And like I said, he's got another trial coming up and he has an appeal. So I'm going to watch that and then I'll see what I think about the whole thing. All right, we're going to take a break and uh, let our audience have some questions for you. Uh, thank you for being here, and we'll be back. Where do you go for help? Last time, you went to your doctor for a prescription. This time, he told you to get the... We're back. Christine Lee is here. She plans to marry Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. Celia Velez would divorce her husband for Lyle Menendez without ever having met him in person. Uh, Christine, if I can start off this segment with you, you said before that Richard Ramirez has told you that he did not commit the murders. He said he's innocent, and, and you believe him. I just wonder, if what if he had admitted to having done it? Would that make a difference to you? Would you then not, no longer be interested in marrying him? Right. I, I wouldn't... Um... Like you said, I just felt sorry for him, and the juror is there saying, I mean, she's there all the time saying she doesn't think he did it, so I don't know. You said you're married, right, already? Common law, by common law. How many years have you been together? Seven. Seven years. Okay, um, so you see one guy on TV, I mean, and you, this guy stands off in the crowd from everybody else who ever met before, I mean, or... No, 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 it's not that. It was, I was more interested in to see what he was like, what goes on in but his But how? I mean, you didn't know anything personally about him. You just heard no, on the court TV. No, that's why I wrote to him. I've written uh, many letters and he's written back. It's back and forth. You know, he, he, yeah. he's written back and what does he want to know about you? He said he wanted a picture. Yeah, I've sent pictures. He's... His grandmother's sending pictures to me, so it's it's not, you know... How many other women do you think he does that with, that he corresponds with? Uh, I'm sure a lot, but and, um, he's asked for my phone number to call at night. And, and he knows you want to marry him? Yes. Mm -hmm. And has he and responded he to me, that? He wants me to go down to California, come down to stay in California, to be back him up, to be with him. Yes, I'd like to ask Christine, uh, why did you select Ramirez? I mean, are you on the rebound from somebody, a relationship well, or something? Yeah, that would be a pretty no, I, had, I had just gotten divorced, and, um, so. <laughs> okay, I understand now. Oh, oh, now you get it. Now you get it. All right. You know, I should say Christine does have two young children. Now, has, has Richard Ramirez met them? Do you allow your children to have contact with him? Um, no, they don't go up there. Mm-mm. They don't go to San Quentin with you. Mm -mm. And, and let's say that, that really the impossible happened, that he was released, that they say, you know, we didn't commit the murders, we're going to let Richard Ramirez out, you do get married. What do you think your, your life would, would be like? Well, I have to see the trial for myself to decide what I think then, because when they had the other trial, I wasn't here. Stand up, please, sir. Uh, yeah, I have a question for uh, Celia. Uh, I'd like to know if uh, you had had any problems with your parents. No, not at all. I don't no. plan on killing my parents anytime soon. I really no. don't. All not right. at all. Oh, okay. Not at all. Thank you. But, you know, that's a common question people are asking about uh, your fathers, your relationship with your dads. Christine? Mm, I wasn't planning on killing anyone either. Everything was fine. <laughs> all the people that, like I said, visit the men in prison more feel sorry for them. They don't feel like going out and killing someone. They more feel sorry for them. But everybody also feels sorry for the victims, too. It's not like... You know, not like anyone's saying they did a good job or anything. Everybody feels sorry for them as people, but the victims also. So. Uh, Ramirez has become very much a celebrity. There have been groupies, there have been women before you who have really fallen, thrown themselves at him. Just a juror. How, but how do, you feel, how do you feel about that? I mean, he seems to kind of enjoy it all. Um, He's well, like a rock star now. Lately... 
they've had a lot on TV about serial killers. And um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not the one that's putting it all on. It seems like all these shows are, right. it's you know, exaggerating. Yeah, all these shows are exaggerating everything and blowing it out of proportion about serial killers. Well, I mean, you know, it, you take 13 brutal deaths. I don't mm -hmm. really know how much more out of proportion you can can go on that. No, I mean about them, you know, making up cards about them and magazines about them and all. Right. She's she's uh, referring to these uh, serial killer trading cards, which are quite popular, very profitable. In fact, the uh, merchandiser for those cards will be out on the show a bit later on. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Um, this is for Cecilia. Um, is it the man that you want, or is it the money that you think you might have? No, and he doesn't have any more money. You never know. The trials and everything. It's been. It's, it's cost gone? a lot of money. It's him personally. It's what what he's about. He didn't intentionally kill his parents. He was molested, and they have proof to that. Well, that's that's of course has your opinion as right now. Sure. We've got to go. You may have seen Christine on other other shows, and and uh, it's my understanding that you discuss these kinds of appearances. Uh, with Richard. I want to get into that aspect of it and, and look at the whole involvement of the media. I mean, is the media to blame by turning killers into today's superstars? We're going to look for some answers when we come back. I was asking Christine, who is engaged to Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, about her conversations with him concerning appearances in the media. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys have sort of negotiated for a, a lot of this publicity, have you not? Um, well, what happened was one day I went up to see him, this was three years ago, and somebody from the media was there from USA Today, and they took a picture of me, and then they stuck it on like the front page or the second page of the newspaper. In fact, it was on the second page of that paper and it was on the front page of all the papers in California. And the day after that, my phone was ringing off the hook from every single talk show, every single news show, every single tabloid show. And it's three years now and I get two, usually two shows a month for the past three years. How much money would you say you've made basically off of the Night Stalker? Well, he... Mm, mm, well, I didn't make it totally off him, like I said, I've been visiting him all the time, and when I first started visiting him, I thought it would just keep quiet, I didn't know that all this was going to happen, and... Our fascination with your fascination. So, I mean, right. wait, $100,000? I don't, I didn't, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> Well, that's part of what we, what we want to get into today, is whether the media is turning homicidal criminals into heroes. And I want you to meet our next guest. Robert Peters of Morality and Media insists that the media feeds what some would call a sick fascination. But Diane Diamond says that reality shows like hard copy are only fulfilling their responsibility by reporting on these killers. They're here to give their opposing views. Please welcome from hard copy, Diane Diamond and Robert Peters. Welcome. Before we kind of get generally into this discussion, um, I thought it might be helpful if we just start with a, a clip that I think is somewhat representative uh, from, from your show, Diane. If we can roll the clip from hard copy, please. I'm upset with hard copy. And all you people who keep putting that shit out on, 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 the, on the air, I'm going to give you another reason why I'm here. I'm here to help you a little bit. Because the guy next door to me said, Charlie, I know you, and I like you, and you've helped me out of a few tight situations, and I owe you one. I said, what's that? He said, I seen that show on TV the other day, and that's wrong. I get out in eight months. Is there anything you want me to do? Now, what do you want me to tell him? Do you want me to tell him to come and see you? Do you want me to be the guy you're trying to make me? Do you want me to be the guy that er orders people to die? Do you want me to be the dispensation of life and death? You convicted me for dispensating life and death, man. The president of the United States can't even do that. Mm. That, that was to correspondent Doug Bruckner. Um, one of my colleagues was doing that interview. It's frightening. It's, it is so eerie, Diane. Yeah. It yeah. really is. I mean, so, so that brings up the, the big, wide, general question about when you air interviews like that, the, the stories that go on and on. Yeah, but they're not our views. They're stories, like you say. They're stories like these two ladies, and they're interesting. I cannot conceive of falling in love with an, a convicted murderer. I cannot conceive Charlie Manson ever getting out 
of prison. But these two women are saying that's the reason why they have the attraction for these men is because of stories that they see on, on reality-based shows that glorify them. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, with all due respect, ladies, we don't glorify Charlie Manson. We don't glorify the Menendez brothers or Richard Ramirez, who we've also done stories on. We don't glorify them. We tell their stories. You read about, about them in the newspaper, but it's more interesting to look at them. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Robert, jump in here. Well, I don't see anything wrong with uh, interviewing a convicted killer per se. Uh, to me, it has to do with the number of convicted killers we interview in contrast to perhaps um, people who did something good in life and something constructive and oh, something that would set maybe a good role model for we young ladies like or young men. And certainly, now, I mean, the, in her defense, hard copy does do an awful lot of, you know, positive feel-good stories too, especially as of late. Well, the, another aspect of it is, I think, is what is the motivation? And uh, certainly even me reading the mainstream television critics uh, and the industry itself has confessed that it really has done a lot of this simply to get attention, to get ratings. I have an article from uh, December Time magazine in my pocket that uh, where the, the tabloids of which uh, hard copy is mentioned are basically confessing that in the past they've, they've, they've focused too much attention on what might be considered the sordid side of life. And now they're beginning to reform and try to take a more constructive approach. I will assume that occasionally that might include an interview with a murderer because there might be a reason for it other than appealing to the worst side of our human nature so pretty, and getting ratings. You're pretty satisfied now with the tabloid shows. Then. Well, I'm just, I tell you, my information largely about tabloid shows comes from reading the mainstream press. I live in New York City and I buy the dailies and I represent a national organization and people send us uh, articles from TV critics and that's my, that's most of my information. So about if it were up to you, we would, not, we would not interview convicted killers. Oh no, I said the opposite. I, if it were up to me, you wouldn't maybe, on the whole, you wouldn't interview quite so many and mm -hmm. if you did interview a convicted killer, you would do it because there was a true good reason to do it that might help the society be better rather than just attracting an audience so that you can keep your ratings and bring in advertisers and I, stay I on the air. That's understanding not, the aberrant mind is a not perfect the right reason. motive. Perfect but, motive. But let's look at these two women who are attracted to that aberrant mind. Um, mm -hmm. Were it not for the media's attention and and uh, the the you know the the plethora of stories that, that the proliferation that you know of these of these admitted killers, would these two women not be here today? Well, I, if I could take that question, with all due respect, ladies, they maybe saw Menendez on television, they maybe saw Ramirez on television and latched their attention onto those two. If it wasn't those two, it would have been two others. You know, well, you know, it, which, which may on, be true. It's not I mean, anything wrong with the media. It's wrong with the receptor. And I would Celia, just, did, uh, did you, I mean, she does have a point because did you not say to our producers that you at one point were attracted to Son of Sam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but so. Okay, hang on to your questions, audience. We'll be out here next, okay? Right back. talking about making heroes out of killers. We have hard copies, Diane Diamond here and Robert Peters of Morality in Media joining um, Celia and Christine, both of whom are in love with ad admitted killers. I know you say you think he's innocent and that you, your heart went out to him, you felt sorry for him, but what would you say are, are the good qualities of Richard Ramirez? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, you love, no, you love him, you plan that, to no, marry also him. What's happened is that from him being on all these shows, especially the past few years, and then making cards of him and books of him, now he, he thinks like he's something like, <clears throat> like you said, like a rock star. And now like he's, he acts different than he acted four years ago. So you've seen a change. Are you ever scared around him? No, because there's always guards around all the time. What's he going to get? Now, go ahead. Well, um, I just, this is for both of you, but you both said that the initial motivation was um, you both felt sorry for him, and also you went so far as to Cel Celia to say is that you uh, even excused almost what he did. Do you guys know what you're in for when there's no guards around, and do you think you're going to be the one to actually change him? Like, I don't believe I'm going to change him, do you, but... You don't want to change him? Like, 
you're accepting I what... I believe he had reason for what he did. I do. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, this is for Celia. Um, that's a two-part question. First of all, do you, you know, you said you've talked to the grandmother, and I just wondered if you talked to the grandmother and if you, or you're close with the grandmother, and also, do you feel deep in your heart that Lyle really loves you and that he will no, marry you? No, I never you? said he oh, loves okay. me, no. Okay. But, um... I do believe we can establish a relationship, mm -hmm. that's for sure. And with his grandmother, no, I don't know her personally, but we have spoken. Oh, okay. so. Christine, what about, um, stand up, ma'am, what about your other relationships? I mean, you know, you do have these two kids to think about. I mean, you know, you would think that you would look for someone who would be father material and to, to build a realistic family with. Um, I don't, I'm not really looking for anyone now i don't i was married and i didn't like being married i didn't i don't like it like i don't know <laughs> is part of the attraction for you to having uh, a lover in jail that you only have to see him when you want to see him yeah <laughs> oh, no. are you too afraid when they get out that you guys might be a victim of killing or no you guys might no afraid i of don't that? believe so no no you just believe all. that when they get out that you guys are just the one the only and nothing's gonna happen to you. Richard's not, yeah. his chances of getting out aren't that high, so. <laughs> yeah. then, yeah. on, this is not a realistic yeah. dream that Christine we, is harboring. Go well, ahead, Robert. Uh, well, my, my quick comment is that it seems today that the people who are becoming the heroes in our society are not the people who do something exceptional and good. It's the people who do things that are not good. But, you know, I don't think of Richard Ramirez as a hero. I don't think of L Lyle Menendez or Eric Menendez as a hero. I think of them as I murderers. They're on TV every five minutes, and yeah, so but many people see them. I mean, now it's a good think. story. They killed their parents. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. These are good stories. It doesn't mean you have to fall in love with them or think they're a hero. <laughs> what about uh, the I'm celebrity aspect of it? Does that play into your infatuation that they are celebrities? I don't, I don't believe so. No, no. Christine? No, because when I first started seeing him, this, this all was like the tabloid shows wasn't going on or anything, and I thought it would just be quiet. And then, like I said, all of a sudden one day, they got a picture of me, and then it was just like, it's been, for the past three years, it's like I said, my phone's been ringing off the hook from all these TV shows and everything. All right, who feeds the media's ravenous appetite for all the lurid details that we've been talking about? Some say the lawyers, the media advisors. We'll find out from Amy Fisher's attorney when we return, and we'll be right back. Nyberg gained fame of his own simply by becoming the lawyer of one of the most infamous young women of the 90s. Her name, Amy Fisher. And he does continue to advise her, negotiate her movie and book deals, and attract media attention, all because his client shot Mary Jo Buttafuoco in the head. Here to tell us how all the hype really happened, please welcome attorney Eric Nyberg. <laughs> Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Did this shock even you how big it all became? Yes, it shocked me. In fact, uh, when the officials first came to see me, I was vacationing in a, in a house upstate New York, and they came in, and we spoke for about two and a half hours, and they left. I turned to my wife, and I said, you know, I think this is going to garner some local attention. Needless to say, the understatement of 1992. Story. That is an understatement. I mean, really, but remember when it first happened, you were the first one that got the attention, really. Um, you kind of harnessed the media in the very beginning. Well, it, it wasn't exactly like that. The, the case received local attention immediately. Like, the police uh, are, like to label a case, and they labeled it the Long Island Lolita Near Fatal Attraction, and it captured the headlines. Usually a case will go away uh, and then come back maybe at the time of trial. What happened in Amy's case is there developed a cadence, a certain degree of timing. Uh, the next week there was a story on current affair that, was, uh, that kept it in the limelight. Then a judge set a bail of $2 million. It brought it back up again. Mm -hmm. And then one day we were, uh, I was in the, uh, my backyard with my daughter, uh, who's an assistant district attorney in Queens County, New York, and we were talking about the bail situation. I had how to get her out because I needed her out to pre uh, prepare the case. And um, we came up with the idea that, look, she has only one asset, and that's the notoriety that she had received to that point. And I called a friend up from CBS. I'd been swimming in my pool in the backyard, and I said, look, come on over. 
I have a story for you. And I bring a camera crew. And he did. And I was in my bathing suit, and I said, just wait a minute. I went upstairs, I put a shirt and a tie and a jacket. My bathing trunks. I said, don't shoot me below the waist. <laughs> uh, and I said that anybody that could come up with the bail, uh, I give the rights to the story. And it aired at 6.30 of the 6.30 News. And at 6.35, my service began to call me, and the remark was, what happened? <laughs> Everybody wanted this. The action was immediate and it was hot. And really, I mean, it, it hasn't died down all that much. Tell me, tell me what's in the works that, that you've been involved with. She's got a, a couple of book deals. No, Amy, understand something. Amy never got anything. Amy never benefited a dime's worth from the, the notoriety. Amy you does not consider bail. herself a celebrity. She, she considers the celebrity as somebody that does something good. All the money that was made was made by the media, made by the people that signed up, made by the people that made the movies. Amy never took a dime, nor will she ever take a dime. What she is doing is she is writing now for magazines. She's a, she's a talented writer. She's painting. She's a talented painter. She's designing. Uh, she'll benefit from that because of who she is. It'll gain attention when she comes out with it, but she will rise or fall on her own ability and nothing else. She'll never take a dime for, for what has happened. What, what is currently in the works? As I said, she's writing, she's painting, she's designing. I mean, as far as on uh, her story. Aren't there a couple Nothing. of books? Nothing. Oh, in the works now, there, well, there, there were two books published. There was a three-week wonder that came out right away by a People magazine writer. Uh, there was a, a, a book by uh, a author named Sheila Weller. There were three movies. If I could just comment uh, quickly on some of the, as somebody who comes from New York City, I don't know what the media did across the nation, but uh, Mr. Nyberg and I are aware, and, and, and uh, probably you also, that it was uh, front page headlines in the daily newspapers, at least three out of the four, with, with regularity. And uh, I just make the point that I think there was a very real story. I mean, part, the story to me is why would an attractive young gal get herself involved in prostitution and in sex with an older guy? But that was never the story, trying to understand what went wrong. So maybe, oh, again, I, maybe, I wait, wait, I'll, I'll let you talk so that maybe we could help some girls not do the same thing. I, again, I'm a newspaper reader, and I have in my, another one of my pockets, an article about a young lady who was arrested for prostitution after she watched the made-for-TV movies, and she told the DA that she got the idea for making a quick buck from prostitution from watching the films. Now again, if maybe the, somehow the media had tried to show something positive from this, some lesson, maybe that young gal would have learned something better to do with herself instead of committing a crime because she watched it glorified well, but what can and eroticized they show? on television. What can they show other than what happens, the events as they unfold? Well, to me, you know, I just, I live in New York City. I've lived in New York City since 1971, and I, so that needs to at least know somewhat in terms of what's going on. And, and to me, I mean, every once in a while, there's a story about it, oftentimes a co-ed who is arrested for prostitution. And it really makes you think, why? I mean, I grew up in the 60s, 50s, and kids that I grew up with weren't getting into prostitution. What's happened? Oh, so, so it's I mean, it is, no, no, fault, it's a story. Right? And maybe hard copy could have done something that would have helped that young lady who decided to go into prostitution because she could make a quick buck. We did do some very maybe nice Amy Fisher stories. Maybe you could have helped that young lady find a better way to adjust hard her copy well, was not that woman's problem. That well, woman was that woman's problem. It's just problem. the point that there's, there's <laughs> more to life. There's more to life than prostitution. There's more to life than crime. There's more to life than sleaze and sordidness and tragedy and ugliness and confusion. And what we need well, to see more of in the media really is the opposite obvious of that. support out here. I don't think anybody would differ with that. Let me just redirect this a little bit to, to Eric about, didn't Amy receive, doesn't she continue to receive letters from people all over the world, yes, girls who yes. say, I can understand your situation? There was when she was first incarcerated, I would say that she received between 1,000 and 2,000 letters a week. When the book Amy Fisher, My Story came out, the flood of letters began from every state in the Union and across the world. Uh, most of them very nice, most of them for people who, young people who identified to some extent with her background uh, growing up as a child. Um, she doesn't answer them. Every once in a while we'll come across one letter from a class of young people that inquire about things of meaning and I'll ask Amy to respond, and she does respond, you know. 
we're going to continue with all of these people and, and, and further our discussion because there's no doubt that the media has capitalized on America's criminals. We have, but now even kids' products have gotten into the act. Move over Superman, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's true crime comics. We're going to find out more about that when we come back. happened to the days of wholesome sports heroes, you know, like Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle being collected on trading cards. Check these things out. These are uh, true crime cards. Uh, they depict mass murderers, serial killers, gangsters. They're, they're trading cards. They're new. They're selling very well. We've passed them out to everybody uh, in our audience. I have uh, Al Capone. I have John Wayne Gacy. Uh, do, do you have kids? I've got four kids. Yeah. How would you feel if, if they came home and were collecting these? Well, I wouldn't want them to select their boyfriend out of these cards. <laughs> you know, can I do the same as these girls? Can I get interested in Jim Jones here? And could he be my love of my life? All right, we're going to we're gonna, uh, put this, up, this question up to our panel because you're about to uh, hear from the woman who put these on the market. Please welcome the editor-in-chief and owner of Eclipse Enterprises, Catherine Ironwood. Catherine, I'm sure you, you get responses like that all the time. How do, how do you defend the, the production of these? Well, first of all, trading cards go back a lot longer than sports cards. They started in the 1880s, and the first trading cards were things like pirates and Civil War generals, and they're a kind of encyclopedia fact thing. And sports cards became popular around the turn of the century. So you think that sports cards are what we're copying, but no, they're just the tail that wagged the dog. So that's point number one. Point number two is these aren't really marketed to kids per se, any more than television is for kids or newspapers are for kids. Kids can get a hold of whatever. Well, is there a warning? Is there a warning on here, or is there any no, control over no where they're? No warning here than on hard copy. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, what do you think about these? You know what? I, I, when I heard about them, I was going to say, oh, how ridiculous. But I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm, I'm reading all about Richard Ramirez, as a matter of fact. Well, I'll tell you something. When we were waiting to go on, one of the producers was asking, how many people did Richard Ramirez kill? And he goes, I think I wrote down 37. It was just a filler number. You've got to check that number. You I had it. the card. I said, hey, you know, but they weren't listening to me. They had to go look it up. Murder. That's what these cards are for. 13, right. 13 but it, it tells how they did their crimes. Um, go ahead. Um, I think these promote the violence, and I have a 13-year-old boy, and I'd get really upset if he got a hold of a pack of, of these. And what I wanted to ask Christine is, you said you make money off these shows? I didn't say that. Okay, well, you were asked if you made a certain figure. Anyways, what I want to know is, does Richard, do you give Richard X amount of dollars for going on here and telling your so-called story? No. no. Okay, down here. Stand up, please, ma'am. Christine, don't you have children? Do I have children? Yeah, I have children. Two children. And I wouldn't let them see those cards. But you'll date the you man who murdered the people? He, they, my sons don't know him. They don't know about that. They're little. The one... what, if you, what if you marry him? You say whether he's out or not. You plan to marry him next October. How do you tell them who your husband is? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Um, I just want to say, uh, who are we to judge these ladies here that people fall in love and out of love all the time? And the crimes that these fellows have committed is most unfortunate, but we all commit our small crimes in our own ways. The real crime, I believe, is I think the media has a, a bigger responsibility uh, in uh, printing some of the stuff, which is, goes down to the almighty buck. I'm looking at this, uh, these cards, and I flip them over, and what do I see? I see drugs, 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 alcohol. This guy's a nut. Drugs, <laughs> alcohol. That's I mean, a warning. That's the big crime. That's a warning. That's what these cards are really good for. When I edited these cards, I had been working on cards about blues musicians before that, and I didn't know a darn thing about crime. And in working on these cards, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about fetal alcohol abuse syndrome, sex abuse in the home, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. violence, drugs. These serial killers, and that's only half the cards, because the rest are mafia gangsters. They really have severely disturbed childhoods, and I learned something, and I think if you read all these cards, you'd start to see these patterns. And I, to me, information is good. Any information is good. Absolutely. What First is, Amendment, I believe it. Not, these, are, these are fascinating. Not, I hate to say it, but they are. Not that there has to be a, uh, a moral to every story, but what is the uh, moral to the story of your, uh, you know, uh, 
filling in the American public, and uh, certainly kids will be attracted to cards, just as they're attracted to the, um, you know, the, uh, what is it, the, the, the camel guy for the camel cigarettes, you know, and that's yeah. designed to appeal to adults, but, you know, kids relate to that. I mean, what is the, uh, I mean, what, what, uh, you know, what, what do you intend to do? I, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a lucrative thing, and in American society, that seems to justify just about anything, well, look, look, but why, why, another question would be, why is it do we want to make uh, what ought to be tragedy into in everything that's tragic in our society becomes in some ways a form of entertainment? Well, first of all, to make these, money these from. cards that if you, doesn't seem healthy. Okay, if you ask me for a moral, the, the cards are organized usually in three to four paragraphs. First paragraph is what their childhood was like, and that is usually a tragedy. The second paragraph is what their crimes were, and the third paragraph is how law enforcement captured them, and that's very educational too. So to me, the moral is society does overcome criminals because that's why these people are on these cards. And you know what, Lisa, I'll tell you, if you look at these and you look at Joe Camel, the cigarette guy, and you look at, it all comes down to one thing. If you don't want your kids to watch hard copy or have these or smoke cigarettes, teach them right from the very beginning that smoking cigarettes is not good, that this is what happens to bad people. These are bad people. Yeah, I, I think, as you know, a lot of parents um, aren't involved with their kids, unfortunately, uh, at that level. Hang on. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Do you have a past love who you want to keep around, but your current flame just doesn't seem to understand? Call us or fax in your story, and you might be a guest on our show. Stay with us. Um, it's unfortunate that society made a big thing out of Joey B. and Amy Fisher. Um, Joey B. admittedly committed statutory rape with Amy Fisher, and she was obsessed with him, and she shot his wife, an innocent and all that. You know, healthy people are not attracted to unhealthy people. That is real true and and it's real sad for you guys i'm very grateful that i'm not you today and i'm not perfect i've got problems but uh so you feel like that uh celia and christine are sick they need some outside they need some help if mm -hmm. that's their what story. do you guys we'll think well, yeah. <laughs> Where's the... if uh the phone stops ringing and the media doesn't knock on your door anymore are you gonna stay with mm -hmm. old richard boy well, I, said, I was seeing him before any of this started I just got a comment, you know, it seem, seems like these ladies kind of misdirected, you know, trying to go after these cats, because even when they get out of jail, man, who the heck want to hire them? I wouldn't let them wash my LTD. Uh, they're, they're very unhealthy men, and you women, as far as your self-esteem, I think it's very low, and I think you need to look at yourselves. We have looked at ourselves. You, you, you don't and know her, her so you and the blonde lady over there that's wearing the man's boots don't know everything about us or what's going on that you don't see on the TV. That's you don't know everything that's going on. There's a lot more that you don't know. All right, we so gotta don't, go. So be we'll right back. Shoot up your mouth. Be right back. Hang on. The typical offender uh, begins early and victimizes a lot of different kids. There's people out there looking for your kids. They're hunting for them. Yeah, nobody's going to look as hard as that well, so. All on the next Lisa. Well, our audience is no different than society as a whole. I mean, as a culture, we are fascinated by bad guys. This audience, as well as society in general, has overwhelmingly condemned the men that you love. And, and that's no secret to you. <laughs> but you stand by your, your heart. You love these guys no matter what. Yeah. Well, I don't know why they're so quick to tell us what to do because, like I said, they don't know everything. Yeah, they're like, not I'm not sitting here not telling hands. her. She needs to lose weight and get her teeth fixed. But I'm not, like, you know, t standing up telling her that. You know, but since she's so quick to start telling me things when she doesn't know everything about me or what's going yeah, on, you, you people are only seeing a yeah, small part all, right. of us. You don't know everything. Right. You don't. You don't know. Tell us. That's another show. Unfortunately, we are uh, out of time. Thanks, though, for coming on. We appreciate.